Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring, and the latest long overdue entry in my series called Stick to the Script, where I read a written review of a game. And being a channel known for its timely coverage of games, I thought I would revisit my written review of the sadly out of production Shadows Over Hammerhall from Games Workshop. This review is a slightly revised and updated version of the review that originally appeared in written form on my blog, which is linked in the video description. I hope you enjoy it, and consider liking and subscribing at the end. Once upon a time, there was a world of arcane lore and monsters. It was a harsh, cruel world, where only the strong survived and war was without end. No, I don't mean secondary school. This was a tough world, a violent world. Yet it was also a world of humour, where amidst the horror of war you could find something laugh out loud hilarious. And it was also a world of beauty, it was a world where you could battle through the hurt and the pain, and in the heart of darkness find a small glimmer of something so wonderful it made everything worth fighting for. No, I really don't mean secondary school. This was not our world. And yet, in some ways, it was not so very different. This world was the old world, the world of Warhammer fantasy battle. As a child, it was the place I retreated to when reality became too dark, the place I spent most of my time. It was home. And then it blew up. In fairness, it blew up long after I stopped visiting. Regulars to my blog have often heard me lament how I sold every board game and every single Games Workshop miniature I owned before I went to university. Years after that, I rekindled a passing interest in Warhammer and picked up a hardback copy of the 6th edition rules. I even bought a few Bretonian models. Yeah, that was the best choice. But I never really got back into playing it. I don't know why really, it just didn't inspire me like it used to. And then, like I said, it blew up. Games Workshop did something I never expected. They tore down what they had built, and they started to build again. They advanced the storyline, and in doing so created something more epic, something mythical. As a fan of mythology, particularly Greek mythology, I was immediately interested in the new Mortal Realm setting. I found it fascinating, but also lacking. It was very new and very shiny. The old world was a gnarled, aging, filth-coated creature that had evolved over the years. It was like a rotten corpse clawing its way through the dirt. By contrast, Age of Sigmar was a blinding bolt of light from the heavens. It was so blinding it was almost impossible to see exactly what it was. When you did catch a glimpse, all you saw were contradictions. There were familiar races with unfamiliar names, and new races with strangely familiar designs. There was a new world forged from the old world, bearing the marks of the nine winds of magic but drowning in chaos. There were humans that were like gods, and gods that seemed all too mortal. And as much as I liked the setting, it never felt quite right. It never felt like home. The main issue was, I simply couldn't see the human element. Among the godlike warriors and demented fiends that killed for the sake of killing, I couldn't find the purpose of it all. Where were the human cities? What happened if Sigmar lost? What was at stake? I found it impossible to care about all the endless fighting, because I had no idea what anybody was fighting for. That's something that Games Workshop have addressed in the years since. They have gradually sought to rectify that oversight and make their new setting feel more human. And that all started with Warhammer Quest Shadows Over Hammerhull, the sequel to 2016's absolutely incredible Silver Tower. And so the story begins. Silver Tower was an instant classic in my book. It looked beautiful, it had fresh game mechanisms, it improved on the original Warhammer Quest in most ways, in my opinion, and it offered a satisfying and in-depth cooperative experience for up to four players. All it lacked was a more comprehensive campaign system, and the option to play the game with one person taking on the role of an evil overlord to run the dungeon and control the monsters. I think most people expected Hammerhull to flesh out the few areas of the game that were lacking, I think most of us were expecting a standalone expansion with a Games Master mode, new tiles, new heroes, and a new adventure in a new setting. I don't think any of us were expecting Games Workshop to jettison the cooperative mode, the very thing that had made Silver Tower such a joy. None of us were expecting it, because removing the cooperative mode is a fundamental change. It's reaching right into the centre of the game, ripping out its beating heart, and using a Games Master like a life support system to keep the whole thing going. And yeah, I was disappointed. I was disappointed because I'd got used to being a good guy. 
or as good as you can be when you're playing a psychotic slaughter priest. I didn't want to have to leave my group of heroic allies and take up arms against them, but that's what Hammerhall was forcing me to do. As the owner of the game, I was the one destined to be the games master. Naturally, I thought the Games Workshop designers had lost their collective minds. It's very easy to think that when someone, anyone, makes a call you don't agree with. But over time, I started to think about it more, and I realised that Hammerhull was exactly the product it needed to be for the Warhammer Quest product line to remain viable, sustainable and relevant. In order to take a step forwards, it had to take a step back. The result is more than a standalone game, more than an expansion. It's a companion. It's Silver Tower's other half. The original Warhammer Quest was generous to the point of farce. It was a solid cooperative game, a fun competitive game, and a light role-playing game all in one box. You could play it on your own, with a group of friends, or against a group of friends. You could play with the models in the box, or with any Games Workshop models you owned. You could play the adventures included, or make your own. It wasn't a game, it was a world. It was the old world. Home. With Shadows Over Hammerhall, Games Workshop recreated that kind of experience in the way only possible in today's market, with today's production costs. They split up that experience into different boxes, just like they split the old world into the different mortal realms. And much like the mortal realms, contradictions abound. Shadows Over Hammerhall is a beautiful production. For your money you get four heroes, plus a cool companion character, 26 adversaries, a thick rules book packed with lore and painting guides, an adventure book that includes campaign rules, skill and treasure cards, sundry cards for other in-game situations, a boatload of cardboard dungeon tiles, and a surprisingly small amount of tokens for tracking wounds and gold. The miniatures are stunning, the board art is detailed and evocative, the rules book is crammed with line sketches and stories. It looks like a passion project. It looks like something that someone cares about more than anything. And yet... Sigh. What do you mean? I'm I'm supposed to. I've written sigh. I'm supposed to. I'm supposed. To, it's like a stage direction. I'm supposed to sigh. Ah, drama. Okay. <sighs> it still manages to look a little cheap in places. For a start, every single model in the box is repurposed from existing Age of Sigma stock, which makes sense from a production standpoint yet feels like a cost-cutting exercise. Perhaps even worse, the game doesn't have colour-coded dice like in Silver Tower, or even include enough dice for each player to have their own set of four. That may seem insignificant, but the dice in Silver Tower served a purpose. They were a way for each player to know his or her colour. If you forgot what colour token represented you on the Renown Tracker, which was a kind of experience wheel, your dice would remind you. If all the heroes had to roll a dice for an event, you could chuck them all together without risk of confusion, and you didn't have to constantly pass dice around the table. For Games Workshop to turn their backs on the idea of colour-coded dice and chuck in 12 generic black dice in the Hammerhall box doesn't so much feel like a cost-cutting exercise as it does an admission that they expect everyone to already have a copy of Silver Tower in the first place. Indeed, I am using all the dice, renown counters, and even the renown wheel from Silver Tower in my games of Shadows Over Hammerhall, not least because the renowned tokens in Hammerhall seem to have been chosen without the slightest care for anybody who's red-green colourblind. But the contradictions don't end there. It's supposed to function as a standalone product, yet it has insufficient dice and a limited selection of just four adversary types and four heroes. It functions as an expansion, but it lacks the cooperative mode. All the cards have different backs making it difficult to mix the two sets together, and while the adversaries are compatible in both games, there are no clear rules for how to incorporate them. It's all designed so it can work together, but there's a lack of finesse. It's like mixing official Lego blocks with those knockoff ones you get in discount stores. Sure, you can put the bits together and make something, but it's not always a perfect fit. And you can just tell. Even the four heroes in the game are a contradictory bunch. It's the classic combo of a knight, a dwarf, an elf, and a spellcaster. But the knight is a healer, the elf is a brawler, the dwarf is a marksman, and the spellcaster is an adept swordmaster. Overall, the game is a nod to the past, and even draws heavily on elements from Advanced Hero Quest, including the need to draw a map as you explore the dungeons, spending time in the city between adventures, and searching for traps and secret doors. Yet at the same time, the game gives us a small glimpse into the future with a gripping storyline that hints at the return of the Chaos God Slanesh. And what a story. Of all the things packed into the Hammerhall box, the beautifully produced 72-page rules book is really the most exciting. 
Besides the rules, it has a fantastic painting guide, some truly wonderful artwork, and a 30-page novella that describes the city of Hamahau, sets the scene for the adventure, and introduces our heroes. I'm not going to go into great detail because it's a fun story that you need to read yourself, but in a nutshell, Hamahal is a massive city that stretches through a realm gate and therefore has districts existing in two distinct realms. One part of the city is in the realm of fire and chaos, and the rest is in a lush living forest. Beneath the city are endless catacombs, and it's there that our four heroes come to blows with the forces of chaos in an attempt to uncover a conspiracy. What I really liked about the story was the amount of new information it provided about the world. For example, Hamahal is one of Sigmar's great cities, but as it expands and its borders reach farther into the chaos wastelands around it, the older districts get left behind. They fall into disrepair and become no less desolate than the realm Sigmar attempts to conquer. It's a bleak revelation of the true cost of an endless war. We also learned more about Stormcast Eternals. For so long they had been seen as implacable, emotionless demigods, but they are actually real people. They have to deal with the anguish of knowing that the dream of Sigmar's sparkling cities is, in truth, a nightmare of daily misery. And they battle with the knowledge that they are unable to provide mortals with the better lives they spend their own lives over and over again fighting for. The story also had a lot of fun teasing the fans at a time when many things about the Age of Sigmar setting were still a mystery. Twice, characters tried to figure out what Stormcasts really are. One character questions whether the mighty demigods eat and have vital organs, while another character wants to peel off a Stormcast skin to find out what makes him tick. In both cases, no answers are forthcoming. It was an artful troll that made it clear Games Workshop were going to reveal things in their own time, in their own way. And of course, since the game came out, there has been a lot more literature set in Hammerhal and the Mortal Realms, which fleshes out this whole universe in more detail. Really, Shadows Over Hammerhal is a wonderful game. But more than that, it's a wonderful setting. It's a wonderful resource. At the time of its release, it was probably the most comprehensive resource for learning the plight of the common humans in a world ruled by demigods and drenched in magic. It was our first glimpse at the dirty street-level drudgery of day-to-day -day existence in a world where any moment could bring horrors beyond imagination. That makes the game important. It makes it a milestone. But at this point, I fear I've talked for a very long time without really talking about how the game plays. That's not really intentional, but it's indicative of the kind of game this is. It's so much more than the sum of its rather simple mechanisms. It's an experience. It's a deeply thematic, rich and rewarding adventure in a world that starts to come to life before your eyes. It's one of those games where, when you've finished, you don't talk about how well you played or what bit of the dice rolling system you enjoyed. You talk about the stories. And now a games master is an integral element of those stories. To be honest, if you ignore the Games Master element, this really is very similar to Silver Tower. There are a few minor tweaks to the rules, but basically, if you hated Silver Tower, I'm not convinced Hammerhall is going to change your mind. The central mechanism of the game is a cool dice system, whereby each hero rolls four dice and then allocates those dice to actions such as moving, healing, exploring, searching and special moves. As the heroes take wounds, they get to roll less dice, until eventually the number of wounds exceeds the number of dice, and they are knocked out. Knocked out heroes revive as soon as there are no monsters around, but from then on they have a permanent injury that reduces the number of action dice they roll each turn. Each time they get knocked out, they get an additional permanent injury and lose an additional action dice. It's a very clever, very thematic way to represent how damage escalates over time, affecting a hero's combat prowess. Of course, the downside is that if the heroes start to take a battering, the game starts to grind. Rather than performing four or five actions per turn, heroes are only performing two or three, then just one. Once the adventurers are in trouble, they don't often go out in a blaze of glory, they tend to just bleed out in the dark, rather depressingly. But when the heroes are fresh-faced, bright-eyed and, in some cases, bushy-tailed, the game moves along at an exciting clip. The heroes move from room to room using actions to open portals. Every time they do, the Games Master refers to a map in the adventure book and then sets up the new room with any monsters lurking within. Heroes always have the option to stop exploring to heal or search, but the longer they tarry, the more risk there is of the Games Master launching an ambush that spawns randomly generated monsters or events to cause havoc. Once monsters are on the board, the proverbial tends to hit the proverbial. For each type of monster, the Games Master rolls a dice and refers to a behaviour chart. The chart details how the monsters fight that turn, and may even unlock powerful abilities such as spells and stronger attacks. However, if the Games Master doesn't like the behaviour role, 
they have the option to ignore it and make a basic move and attack action with each monster. It's an interesting way of giving the Games Master the chance to activate special abilities, and it prevents the Games Master from picking on the weakest hero all the time, or constantly firing off devastating spells. Of course, as each monster has a behaviour chart, it also ensures they are compatible with Silver Tower's cooperative play. Killing monsters is the main way of gaining renown. Once a hero has 10 renown, he or she, but in the case of the heroes in the box, just he, gains a new skill. Heroes are allowed to have as many skills as their current level, which starts at 1 and goes up to 4, and over time it's possible to discard and replace skills to tailor characters to a specific playstyle. I absolutely love this upgrade system. It doesn't rely on boring stat boosts, and it doesn't lock you into keeping a specific skill after you select it. You really do get a sense that your character is evolving and improving, and linking experience to skills means that over time the game becomes more interesting by unlocking more actions on each turn, or encouraging you to approach monsters and situations in new ways. So the heroes explore, they reveal some new chambers, they bash some heads together, they gain some renown, and then they get a chance to search for secrets. Searching is a new mechanism introduced especially for Hammerhall. In almost every location, the heroes have a chance to search, and searching almost always generates a minimum of one gold piece. Usually, searching also reveals some useful information, some treasure, or even a secret door to a new location, where there might be more gold and treasure. The only downside is it takes time, and that means there is an increased risk of an ambush. It's an interesting idea, and is of course reminiscent of HeroQuest, but in practice, it does seem to feel a bit pointless sometimes, because heroes are always going to search. If they are always going to search, it often feels like the secrets and hidden traps are a bit irrelevant. Traps usually get found before it matters, and the heroes are never ever going to miss a secret door or hidden stairwell. When searching becomes the stock response to revealing each room, it doesn't feel like an exciting or interesting choice anymore, it just feels like going through the motions. Unfortunately, I don't really see much of a way around that. If the heroes know there are secrets to find, they are going to burn actions looking for those secrets. I guess you could introduce degrees of success whereby it's possible for heroes to successfully search the room without revealing all of its secrets, but that feels like it would be a bit unfair, especially if it meant the heroes never found a secret door and they didn't get to see a big chunk of the dungeon. Oh yeah, notice how I said THE dungeon there? I mentioned it briefly before, but it's worth repeating. All the adventures in the Hammerhall box form a single narrative campaign, and that whole campaign takes place in a single dungeon. Except for a few bonus missions which were printed in White Dwarf magazine, and which take place in other areas. It's a fascinating concept, and again, something that comes from Advanced Hero Quest, because as you explore the dungeon you find stairwells, some lead down to a deeper level, some lead up to a level you have previously explored, and some lead all the way to the surface where you get to visit the city of Hammerhall, do a bit of shopping, or go for a well-earned drink. This structure means the adventure is only over when it's truly over. Moving to a deeper dungeon level doesn't heal your wounds or reset your experience, it just advances the story. And you can retrace your steps at will, which is why it's a very good idea to draw a map. If you decide to visit the city, you get a minor breather, but the game doesn't end there. Visiting the city is the new campaign element introduced for this game. It's pretty basic, but more than enough to make for a satisfying story-driven adventure. When you visit the city, the Games Master generates a random event, and then each hero gets to visit one location. These locations provide opportunities to buy items, learn new skills, or get special bonuses that last for a finite time. Furthermore, things you do during your adventures have the potential to affect what's happening in the city in small ways. And that's just neat. For all its little oddities, Hammerhall is, at heart, a very traditional style of game. Almost old-fashioned, really, and the flow and structure of the game is quite at odds with the rather modern action dice mechanism. It works, though. It's such a blast from the past, it feels totally fresh and exciting. There really isn't anything like this game on the market right now. It's very much its own thing, even within the series of modern Warhammer Quest games, and I love it dearly for that. Of course, it's not without faults. Obviously, its biggest fault is that it's out of production, but putting that aside, it focuses exclusively on competitive play with the Games Master. I think it was a slightly misguided approach because there's really no reason not to include cooperative play. Now, don't get me wrong, I realise Hammerhall's narrative campaign requires a Games Master to keep track of the secrets, despite um, various fan-made efforts to remove the Games Master element, but honestly, I actually have fun being the Games Master. 
Even so, Games Workshop could have and should have at least included a little deck of dungeon location cards so we had the chance to create randomly generated dungeons to explore. I have a few other minor complaints too. I think Games Workshop missed a trick by not including a Plague Lord enemy. It would have fitted the story perfectly, provided an additional mid-level boss to challenge the heroes, and would have been a nice bonus as there is a hero card for that character in the Silver Tower hero card pack. It also would have been nice to see a Branch Witch hero. She fits the theme of Hammerhal, and while such a hero was printed in White Dwarf, we never ever got a real card for her. I would also say there's quite a lot of legwork involved getting the game to the table, Besides punching tokens and assembling miniatures, and maybe even painting them one day, I had to scan a hero roster sheet, some map tiles, and all of the monster behaviour charts so I didn't have to flick through the adventure books during the game. This was made easier when Games Workshop released a pack of monster cards, something I had asked for right from the very first day of launch, but good luck trying to find those cards now. But anyway, I think that's almost enough from me, other than to mention that in the years since Hammerhouse launch, Games Workshop have announced the return of the Old World as a setting for their games, although what exactly that will entail remains to be seen. Does it mean we'll eventually get a new Warhammer quest in that old familiar setting? I don't know. I hope so. But in the meantime, Hammerhal is a fine substitute. It's more than fine. So maybe I should sum up. Not very good at summing up, it involves being succinct. But if I was going to sum up, I suspect my summation would be something contradictory, which seems only right. Here goes. Once upon a time, the old world blew up, and Warhammer Quest blew up with it. But then a new realm of adventure appeared, an exciting realm that's a pleasure to explore. And sure, I was disappointed that Shadows Over Hammerhall doesn't have a cooperative mode, and I was relieved when Blackstone Fortress was a triumphant return for cooperative play. But sitting here with my copy of Hammerhall, that huge box of miniatures, the lavish rules book, the beautiful room tiles, additional rules for a host of new exotic enemies, countless ideas for new adventures and stories buzzing around my head, and even more memories of crawling through the dungeons of the old world surfacing in my brain, I honestly find it hard to imagine how I could possibly have been happier with the game. Because never before, and not ever since, has Age of Sigmar's mortal realms felt more like home.